there's one theme that is woven through the book of Esther that kind of brings it all together. It is that of God's determination to preserve the Jewish nation from extinction. And thus, that's the reason for the celebration of Purim, which we had here last night. Now, never before in the history of the Hebrews, prior to this incident in Esther, was there such a blatant, unswerving, plainly stated desire from a Gentile government to wipe out the Jewish race. In the days of their Egyptian captivity, the goal of the Pharaoh was never genocide. Rather, it was to keep his hold upon a permanent class of Hebrew slaves in order for him to achieve his goals of, of building roads and canals and grand edifices, thus releasing Egyptian workers to form a nationalist army that could defend and extend Egypt's boundaries. In the Babylonian captivity, the goal was not to wipe out the former citizens of Judah, but rather to punish them for their rebellion. They were indeed removed from their homeland and sent to Babylon. But the purpose was to assimilate the Jews, to use their talents and their abilities, to add to the greater economy, uh, rather to the economy of the greater Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar envisioned, not to kill them. Thus they were treated quite well. Ironically, the Jews' greatest danger has now come not during a time of captivity or oppression, because the Persian king Cyrus had 50 years earlier freed the Jews. But rather it has come during a time of their freedom, of us seeming well-being, a time when they felt secure, when they felt almost at home, out of the clear blue comes a highly placed, influential Persian government official who has some inexplicably deadly bent against the Jews that results from a personal feud with a single Jewish person, Mordecai. But when we find out in chapter 3, verse 1, that this government official is called Haman the Agagite, we then understand, that's good, oh, I knew that was coming. Thank you. Ushers, take that woman. I'm not going to say it again. <coughs> Got me all off my game now. So, come on. <laughs> we then understand that Haman is an Amalekite and he's carrying a spirit of anti Semitism that even he doesn't recognize as having come from his family heritage. He harbors a hatred of God and so of God's people, that began when God separated and divided those twin brothers, Esau and Jacob, into two very different spiritual destinies. Jacob would carry forth God's covenant promise made to Abraham, while Esau would represent those who oppose God's people and God's covenant with them. Amalek, Esau's grandson became the epitome of that spirit of opposition, such that in Exodus 17, 16, the Lord says this of Amalek, Because their hand was against the throne of Yah, God, Adonai will fight Amalek generation after generation. Thus the story of Esther is but a continuation of the everlasting enmity 
and war between Amalek and the kingdom of God. And of course, the story ends in victory for God's people. Well, since the celebration of Purim is upon us, we all had such a great time with it last night, then this question arises. Why should Gentile Christians think that we ought to celebrate an observance that has always been about God rescuing Jews? And I think the answer is clear. Because without the Jews, none of us have a Savior. Pretty simple. Bible prophecies predicting the source of a Savior as the tribe of Judah begins as early as Genesis 49. Later we find out that Messiah must come from a specific clan of Judah, that of King David's. And then the New Testament gives us this lengthy genealogy of Yeshua to prove that he met all those requirements. Satan, using his human minions, we had a few of those running around last night, <laughs> has thus always tried to thwart God's plan for Messiah. If the Jewish race could be exterminated, then we would have no Savior. And God would be defeated. So in our story of Esther, we read last week of Mordecai telling Esther in chapter 4, verse 14, that, For if you fail to speak up now, relief and deliverance will come to the Jews, but from a different direction. But you and your father's family will perish. Who knows whether you didn't come into your royal position precisely for such a time as this. And the idea is that whether Esther takes up the fight and gets involved in saving her people, the Jews, from this coming genocide or not, the Jews will survive. As Mordecai says, relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from a different direction. So the continuing existence of the Jewish people is divinely guaranteed. It hasn't been placed solely upon Esther's delicate shoulders to bear as the only means to their survival. Rather it is that since God has put her, miraculously, in a position to be able to help his chosen people, her own people, then if she doesn't, she and her father's family will perish as a consequence. God has blessed Esther with a unique opportunity that has come in a sliver of time to serve him in a great way. But that opportunity comes with danger. And it comes with a caveat. And the Lord is not pushing all of his chips to the center of the table, win with Esther or go bust. So why should Christians love and comfort the Jewish people? Because we can. Because as Christians we have been given the knowledge, now the opportunity, to be used of God to help deliver his chosen people. And that is what Seed of Abraham Ministries is all about. Why should we join with the Jews and celebrate God's victory over the intended Persian genocide of the Jewish people, Purim? Because our Savior is Jewish, and he can only be Jewish. No Jews, no Christ, no eternal security for any of us. The story of Esther couldn't be any more relevant for those who call Jesus Lord, whether Jew or Gentile. But today, since the devil has already lost because the Jews 
did produce God's Messiah. And Messiah's work on the cross can't be undone. There are only two remaining battlefields where the fight is ongoing. The souls of human beings and the land of Israel. Every human that dies without Christ is a victory for Satan. It is. And we must work tirelessly beginning with our own families to prevent any more losses to the evil one that has to be. And if Satan can somehow get the Jews to lose their modern nation of Israel to pagans, then the place where Christ shall return and set up his kingdom can't be used. And the evil one will have won another battle. Now, am I saying that victory over Satan regarding the land of Israel is in doubt? No. I'm saying that the Lord has allowed us to live at a time, has offered us the unmerited opportunity to help and to comfort his people. To join in the fight to save his land from the enemy. Now, if we choose not to, is the Holy Land lost? No. Like Esther was told, relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from a different direction. But you and your father's family will perish. Fellow believers, I'll say this to you unequivocally. You, we, we have been given an opportunity to help God's people to stay in their land, the promised land, God's kingdom land. But that opportunity comes with a price. It is dangerous, and I'm telling you, we're not going to make very many friends if we do help. And if we don't help, when we have the knowledge that we can and we should, clearly there will be divine consequences for our shying away. Now, as for me and my family, we stand with God. And we stand with his people and with his land. And since this principle is at the very heart of this ministry, if you feel otherwise, I have no idea why you're listening or you're even here today. We're now going to read, or rather reread, <clears throat> Esther chapter 4, and this time I'm going to include the Greek editions. We didn't read those last week, and we'll discuss them briefly. <clears throat> Esther chapter 4. Depending on your Bible, you'll have some of this or you won't. Esther chapter 4 with the Greek editions. When Mordecai learned what had happened, he tore his garments and put on a sackcloth and ashes. By the way, I'm reading out of the uh, uh, Jerusalem Bible. When Mordecai learned what had happened, he tore his garments and put on sackcloth and ashes. Then he went right through the city, wailing loud and bitterly, until he arrived in front of the chancellery, which no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter. And in every province, no sooner had the royal edict been read than among the Jews there was great mourning and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay on sackcloth and in ashes. When Queen Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her she was overcome with grief, she sent clothes for Mordecai to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he refused them. Then Esther summoned Hatach, a eunuch, <clears throat> whom the king had appointed to wait on her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai and inquire what was the matter. Why was he still acting in this way? And Hatach went out to Mordecai, who was still at the city square in front of the chancellery. And Mordecai told him what had happened to him personally, also about the sum of money which Haman had offered to pay into the royal treasury as compensation for the destruction of the Jews. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
He also gave him a copy of the Edict of Extermination, published in Susa, for him to show Esther for her information, with the message that she was to go to the king and implore his favor, plead with him for her people. Remember your humbler circumstances, he said, when you were fed by my hand. Since Haman, the second person in the realm, has petitioned the king for our deaths, invoke the Lord, speak to the king for us, save us from death. Hatach came back, told Esther what Mordecai had said, and she replied with the following message for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of his provinces know that for a man or a woman who approaches the king in the inner court, without being summoned, there is one penalty, death unless, by pointing his golden scepter towards him, the king grants him his life. I have not been summoned to the king for the last thirty days. And these words of Esther were reported to Mordecai, who sent back the following reply. Do you suppose that because you are in the king's palace, you're going to be, one of, you're going to be the one Jew to escape? No. If you persist in remaining silent at such a time, Relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from another place, but both you and the house of your father will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you've come to the throne for just such a time as this. Whereupon Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and assemble all the Jews now in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink day or night for three days. For my part... I and my maids will keep the same fast, after which I will go to the king in spite of the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai went away, carried out Esther's instructions. Mordecai's prayer. Then calling to mind all the wonderful works of the Lord, he offered this prayer. Lord, Lord, King and Master of all things, everything is subject to your power. There is no one who can withstand you in your will to save Israel. Yes, you have made heaven and earth, all the marvels that are under heaven. You are the Lord of all, and there is none who can resist you, Lord. You know all things. You know, Lord, you know that no insolence, arrogance, vainglory prompted me to this, for this refusal to bow down before proud Haman. I would readily have kissed his feet for the safety of Israel. But what I did, I did rather than place the glory of a man above the glory of God. I will not bow down to any but you, Lord. And so refusing, I will not act in pride. And now, Lord God, King, God of Abraham, spare your people. For men are seeking our ruin and plan to destroy your ancient heritage. Do not overlook your inheritance, which you redeem for your own out of the land of Egypt. Hear my supplication. Have mercy on your heritage. Turn our grief into rejoicing that we may live to him your name, Lord. Do not suffer the mouths of those who praise you to perish. And all Israel cried out with all their might, for they were faced with death. Esther's prayer. Queen Esther also took refuge with the Lord in the mortal peril which had overtaken her. She took off her sumptuous robes, put on sorrowful mourning. Instead of expensive perfume, she covered her head with ashes and dung. She humbled her body severely, and the former scenes of her happiness and elegance were now littered with tresses torn from her hair. <clears throat> she besought the Lord God of Israel in these words. My Lord, our King, the only one, come to my help. For I am alone, and I have no helper but you, and I'm about to take my life in my hands. I have been taught from my earliest years in the bosom of my family that you, Lord, chose Israel out of all the nations, and our ancestors out of all the peoples of old times to be your heritage forever, and that you have treated them as you promised. But then we sinned against you. You handed us over to our enemies for paying honor to their gods. Lord, you are just. But even now, they are not satisfied with the bitterness of our slavery. They have put their hands in the hands of their idols. And to abolish the decree that your own lips have uttered, to blot out your heritage, to stop the mouths of those who praise you, to quench your altar in the glory of your house, and instead to open the mouths of the heathen, to sing the praise of worthless idols, to forever idolize a king of the flesh. Do not yield your scepter, Lord, 
to non-existent beings. Never let men mock at our ruin. Turn their designs against themselves. Make an example of him who leads the attack on us. Remember, Lord, reveal yourself in the time of our distress. As for me, give me courage, king of gods, master of all power. Put persuasive words in my mouth when I face the lion. Change his feeling into hatred for our enemy, that the latter and all like him may be brought to their end. As for ourselves, save us by your hand. Come to my help, for I am alone. I have no one but you, Lord. You have knowledge of all things. You know that I hate honors from the godless, that I loathe the bed of the uncircumcised, of any foreigner whatsoever. You know I'm under constraint, that I loathe the symbol of my high position bound around my brow when I appear at court. I loathe it as if it were a filthy rag and, and, and don't wear it on my days of leisure. Your handmaid has not eaten at Haman's table, nor taken pleasure in the royal banquets, nor drunk the wine of libations, nor has your handmaid found pleasure from the day of her promotion until now, except in you, Lord, God of Abraham. O God, whose strength prevails over all, listen to the voice of the desperate. Save us from the hand of the wicked. Free me from my fears. These two additions that I read to you are known as Mordecai's prayer and Esther's prayer. We're not going to study them, but I do want to make a couple of brief comments about them. Clearly the goal of whoever the writer might have been of the Greek additions, it was to add direct references to God in a book, the Hebrew version, which is otherwise devoid of them. But when we read it carefully, we also find that the writer of the Greek essentially alters the character of this story in some ways. And in Mordecai's prayer, for instance, we read, But what I did... I did rather than place the glory of man above the glory of God, and I will not bow down to any but you, Lord, and so refusing I will not act in pride. Now on the surface, this sounds wonderfully pious. Until we understand that the writer is here saying that Mordecai is refusing to bow down to Haman for no other reason than because Haman is a man. And no good Jew would ever bow before any human but only God. And we discussed last week that this is simply factually incorrect. It doesn't represent reality. And we have been given example after example in the Bible of Jews appropriately and customarily bowing down to kings and potentates, even aristocrats. Rather, there was but one specific man of authority to whom Mordecai would not bow down, Haman. And the reason for this is that Haman was known to be an Amalekite, the sworn enemy of God. Therefore, while most of the sentiments expressed in the Greek additions to Esther are quite good, it is my opinion that they are merely uninspired glosses. They are editorial opinions that should have been recorded as footnotes of commentary never included in the passage as though they were scripture. And by the way, we find this same sort of thing in a couple of critical places in the New Testament. Esther's prayer also takes us down a different road than where the Hebrew text alone has led us. In the Hebrew texts, we see an Esther who's not at all melancholy or resistant or feeling like a prisoner is the queen of Persia. In fact, we see a tone 
of her doing what must be done to become the king's wife, not trying to throw the contest so that some other virgin girl gets the prize. In fact, almost all films and plays based on Esther adopt the Greek editions as the theme and their tone for their scripts because of this drama that they inject. Thus, in Esther's prayer, we hear, Oh, you know I'm under constraint. I loathe the symbol of my high position around about my brow when I appear at court. I loathe it as if it were a filthy rag and do not wear it on the days of my leisure. Your handmaid has not eaten at Himon's table, nor taken pleasure in royal banquets, nor drunk the wine of libations. So with these Greek additions, we now hear of an Esther who's been coerced into everything. She hates her position, she hates wearing her crown, she goes to banquets, but she won't enjoy them. So as with Mordecai's prayer, a different Esther emerges and the prayerful words that are placed into her mouth by this unknown editor. Words that would surely please the rabbis in a later era who despise Gentiles. And they find fault with every element of non-Jewish life. So it's my opinion that these Greek editions need to be set on the shelf. So as chapter 4 opens, Mordecai has learned of the decree to murder all Jews in Persia, and he is dressed in sackcloth, he's mourning, he's walking around the city of Susa, Shushan, shouting bitterly to the city's inhabitants. As he arrived near the place where he often sat as a Persian official, he had to turn away, because it was the law that no person dressed in mourning garb could be present at the king's gate. The news had by now reached most of the provinces and the districts, and the shocked Jews reacted much as Mordecai did. Verse 4 explains that because Esther was in the queen's quarter, she was shielded from the public and from the outside world in general, and she only heard about Mordecai's distress through her servants. And since Mordecai was her adoptive father, she sent fresh clothes to him that he might be made presentable enough to enter the royal harem and come to her to explain the matter. She probably assumed that something of a personal nature had happened to him or or perhaps some family member had passed and she wanted to know about this. They tried, but Mordecai refused. And as a side note, As of this time, Mordecai's relationship with Esther must not have been known inside the palace. Otherwise, Esther's Jewishness would have been assumed from the beginning. So it must have been disturbing to these servants that Mordecai refused the queen's call to come to her. Yet, this would have been thoroughly in character for this stubborn old man who precipitated this madness in the first place by refusing to show respect and courtesy to the man who was now second in command over the entire Persian Empire. Come on. Esther can't leave the harem. So she sends Hatach, a higher official who had been assigned to do her bidding. She sends him to Mordecai. Mordecai opens up. And he tells to talk about the decree, of, even about the 330 talents of silver that Haman used to ply the king into agreeing with his request to annihilate the Jews. And since this issue of the silver wasn't included in the decree, but it had been a private matter between King Xerxes and Haman, no doubt Mordecai had close contacts within the palace. Because That's the only way that he could find out this sensitive information that certainly wasn't public knowledge. Well, Hatak had to meet Mordecai at the courtyard near the king's gate because Mordecai was still wearing a sackcloth. He also gave him a copy of the decree to take in to the queen. Now, Esther was supposed 
to then go to her husband and plead with him to call off this coming atrocity. Hatak did as he was asked, but Esther was none too keen on this idea. She more or less says, look, as any court official knows, one doesn't just invite oneself to go see the king. The fact is, there's a legal code about how all this is to be done. And it is that only when summoned, may anyone have an audience with the king. And if anyone comes uninvited, penalty's death. The only exception is if the king extends his scepter to this uninvited visitor, indicating he takes no offense at this. But, says Esther, the king hasn't called her for a month. Not good. Thirty days is a long time for this king not to at least want to feast his eyes on whom he had not long ago determined was the most beautiful girl in his empire. No hint of what the trouble might be. But Hester sees this as a bad sign. And she has no interest in being executed for her trouble. But Mordecai isn't taking no for an answer. The matter is too important. Esther represents, I think, a dilemma that most of us face at one time or another. A situation suddenly arises that we intensely want to avoid. But we're caught as a fish on a barbed hook. Circumstances demand that we act even if the outcome's unknowable. Our courage to act could mean loss of friendships, status, wealth, health, maybe even life and freedom. Exercising faith suddenly changes from being this kind of comfortable theoretical to an uncomfortable reality. As any believer has learned after living long enough, doing God's will is no guarantee of a satisfactory outcome for us, at least on this present earth. So Mordecai offers Esther three very good reasons why she needs to take the risk and go see the king. First, she isn't to think that while all of her Jewish family and friends are being destroyed, she's going to somehow be spared. She is, after all, a Jew. And the king's decree is that all Jews everywhere are to be killed, no exceptions. And in Persia, we've already seen that not even the king goes against the law, no matter how ridiculous the law might be in afterthought. Mordecai's second reason is the one we discussed at the beginning of today's lesson. It is that if Esther decides not to conquer her fears and instead hopes that someone else picks up the ball and runs with it, she shouldn't assume that the Jews are done for. And this is because Mordecai is certain that God will use another means to deliver his people from this unprecedented calamity that they're facing. However, if she does decline to help, she can be assured that she and her family will be destroyed. The reason for her and her family's demise is not directly stated. But the context is self-evident. That the one who will save the Jews no matter what, the Lord, will see to it personally that Esther and her family suffers death for her unfaithfulness. The third reason is one that's really become a well-known saying in Judeo-Christianity for such a time as this. Mordecai infers it's no random happenstance that Esther, a Jew, was deemed the most beautiful and winsome girl in all the media Persian Empire. It wasn't a coincidence that in a contest of the most beautiful girls and among the king's many wives, 
she was given the crown as Queen of Persia. No, she didn't set out to enter the royal harem. It wasn't her goal to become a queen. But the Lord had equipped her for the position, even if she had never recognized it before that moment that she left Mordecai to enter the Miss Persia pageant. Now on the surface, becoming the queen seems so selfish, so decadent, so frivolous. In God's eyes, it must have seemed trivial and unimportant, she probably thought. But Mordecai tells her, you know, perhaps this moment is what it was always going to be about. The unmerited genetics that made her stunningly beautiful. The inner character that, that raised her above and separated her from all the other beautiful girls. And then the absurd antics of a drunken and a narcissistic king who had committed the rash act of dishonoring his wife, Vashti. Now he needed a replacement. It turns out to be Esther. Could it be that all of these seemingly disconnected things and random acts that they've been orchestrated by God to achieve but one purpose for just a fleeting moment in history to deliver his people from genocide at the hands of Haman. It's mind-boggling. I can tell you without hesitation that while my personal story is nothing as dramatic or important as Esther's, I can identify to a degree with what Mordecai and Esther must have been reflecting upon. How did we get here from there? I could never have foreseen the winding road of my life leading to standing before you today as a minister and a Bible teacher. First being educated at university in archaeology and Egyptology before settling on business. Of racing cars for a number of years to satisfy a selfish ambition. Starting my own high-tech company simply because I was too bored at my job. And then later selling it to a larger one. Only to find myself managing a substantial number of manufacturing locations in the U.S. and Europe. Marrying my wife, who was a staunch believer, a people person who loved the Lord, and prayed for many years for a way to serve Him in a more substantial way. Then suddenly, unexpectedly, finding myself retired, lost, and directionless in my mid-40s chancing upon a small book called the Jewish New Testament in the library of a dear friend, a retiring Bible teacher and pastor, discovering my Hebrew roots and teaching a Sunday school class at a Baptist church. Then due to the subject matter of that class causing doctrinal issues within that church, reluctantly leaving in order to keep peace. But when we left, a hundred people insisted that they wanted to continue studying God's Torah. This resulted in the formation of Seed of Abraham Ministries, and now we're privileged to lead and to serve a congregation, an online retail store, an online Bible teaching ministry, and not one but two vibrant ministries in Israel. Nothing I aim for Nothing I prepared for. I didn't seek it, believe me. Nothing I could have ever imagined myself doing. Nothing I ever wanted to do. And yet, here we are. For such a time as this. 
a ministry just full of people with a heart to help and comfort God's chosen when once again they are under rising pressure from a world that wants rid of them. All I can tell you is this. No matter what is going on in your life, what has happened to you up to now, if you love God, be prepared for a surprise. It is amazing how a bunch of disjointed experiences and false starts and stops and personal failures inexplicable triumphs can suddenly come together at precisely the right moment not to achieve something you planned for but something else that God planned for you that you never saw coming. But as it was with Esther the truth is, there's always a catch. Whatever purpose that God has determined to use you to bring about is going to happen with or without you. I have no doubt that if my wife and I had not said yes to God's plan to create this ministry, having no idea what it would mean or where it would lead us, He'd have used somebody else. Probably somebody else better and much more qualified. As this passage in verse 14 says so clearly, God will bring about his purposes, even if you're not willing to obey him. Take a risk and accept the assignment. But don't ever think that you might have another opportunity if you decline the one that's offered. For it was such a time as this one that you were created. Not some other time of your own choice and your own design. This one, the one God presents to you. In verse 15, Esther responded, just as Mordecai hoped she would. Yes, she'll take a risk. She'll take the matter of the Jews before the king. But Esther also orders that all of the Jews in Susa join with her and with her servants in a fast. This is a long fast, really. No eating or drinking for three days. I mean, what's the purpose of the fast? It isn't stated. But we must always take the Bible in its Hebrew context, unless it's otherwise stated. A fast is invariably for the purpose of preparing oneself to petition God for his favor and to accept the result. The final words of Esther that in this chapter are, Then I will go into the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Now, while there's a great spiritual element to this statement of putting her fate into God's hands after fasting and praying, Esther is also speaking on a practical level. What she is about to do violates the laws of Persia. Violating civil laws to do what seems right to us or to do what God seems to be telling us to do is a real dilemma for followers of Christ. Sometimes we forget that there are other civil law codes in this world than the laws of the United States of America. They are just as valid and often just as justifiable. And it was so in ancient times as well. So what was Esther to do? What are we to do? when there is a direct conflict between God's laws and our nation's laws. This problem has divided the church on numerous occasions and regularly divides families. Usually this problem is called a matter of conscience. On the one hand, the Lord has told us 
to obey our governments because God's established them. On the other hand, he's instructed us to faithfully obey God's commandments regardless of the earthly consequences. There's a dilemma. Yeshua anticipated this problem among his many followers, and he promised us that when we're facing our civil authorities for refusing to obey civil laws that fly in the face of God's laws, he says, I'll give you the words to say. And yet, make no mistake, he never assured us that these words he would give us would lead to our acquittal. Rather, these words are meant to establish God's truth among people who have perhaps never heard it. Not to save us from a bad circumstance. Esther was doing what she knew she must do in order to try to save her people, but it violated the civil laws of Persia to do it. And there were no guarantees it was going to work. Therefore, she is determined to step forward, to take the lead, and to assume the responsibility for her actions. She fully understood this could result in the loss of her life. Who knew what this fickle king might decide? Let's move on to chapter 5. Esther chapter 5. Short little chapter. Page 1093, if you have a complete Jewish Bible. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes, and she stood in the inner court of the king's palace, opposite of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the king's hall, across from the entrance to the hall, and when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the courtyard, she won his favor. So the king extended the gold scepter in his hand towards Esther, and Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. What is it you want, Queen Esther? The king asked her. Whatever your request, up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. If it is all right with the king, answered Esther, let the king and Haman come today to the banquet I have prepared for him. And the king said, bring Haman quickly, so that when what uh, Esther has asked for can be done. So the king and Haman came to the banquet Esther had prepared. And at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, whatever your request, you'll be granted it, whatever you want. Up to half the kingdom, it will be done. And Esther answered, My request, what I want, is this. If I have won the king's favor, if it pleases the king to grant my request and do what I want, let the king and Haman come to the banquet which I prepared for them. Tomorrow I will do as the king has said. That day Haman went out happy in good spirits. But when Haman saw Mordecai at the king's gate, that he neither rose nor moved for him, Haman was infuriated with Mordecai. And nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, where he summoned and brought his friends and Zeresh, his wife. Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, everything connected with how the king had promoted him and given him precedence over the other officials and servants of the king. And indeed, Haman added, Esther the queen let nobody in the banquet with the king that she pre pre had prepared except myself. And tomorrow, too, I'm invited by her together with the king. Yet none of this does me any good at all. As long as I keep seeing Mordecai, the Jew, remaining seated at the king's gate. At this, Zeresh's wife and his friend said to him, We'll have a gallow, 75 feet high, constructed, and in the morning speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on it. Then go in and enjoy yourself with the king at this banquet. I'm on like that idea. So he had a gallows made. Now I'll tell you, Esther did more during those three days of fasting than pray. She worked on a plan. And just how to approach the king and how to circumvent this problem of Haman and the king's certified decree to destroy the Jewish people. So she engineers the circumstances under which she might turn the tables on this evil Haman. Mordecai is nowhere in the picture. Whatever we see Esther doing, she's doing it on her own. Or better, 
because I think is the point of the three days of fasting as she was given direction by the Lord. There is no mention of direct inspiration, but her plan came together too perfectly for it to be anything other than by God's providence. Now, not surprisingly, banquets are involved. Since banquets and drinking parties have been the backdrop of nearly every circumstance that has arisen in this book. If we can just kind of back away from the text far enough to see it as it is, what happens in this and in the next couple of chapters reads like a comedy. Verse 1 tells us that the three-day fast ended and immediately Esther sprang into action. Esther put on her royal robe, she went to the inner court of the king's hall, and this indicated that her visit was official business. This was not a lonely wife looking to spend a little time with her husband. It was respectful. It told all present that it was a, a, um, a formal audience that she saw with the king. However, by going to the inner court, this means she went where only a person who was summoned may go. It was a bold move. Immediately, Esther caught the king's attention. And we're told that immediately she won his favor. He was happy to see her. And in keeping with protocol, the king extended his golden scepter towards her, which forgave her for appearing without being called. Esther touched the top of the scepter, which apparently was the proper response. And the king then asked Esther in the most literal translation, What will thou, Esther? Our complete Jewish Bible says, What do you want? That's the wrong tone. The better meaning is, what's the matter? What's troubling you? He knows Esther. Esther is not one who asks for favors. She wouldn't bother the king for something trivial. Rather, her appearance tells him that she's troubled and the matter's important or she wouldn't think to approach him. So he then asks the second question, what's your request? And to show how pleased and attentive he is to her, he is gracious to say that whatever it is can be up to half his kingdom, and he'll give it to her. Now, without doubt, this is an expression of a grand courtesy and affection, but it's not literal. He is willing to be very generous towards her, but he's not about to give her half of his kingdom merely because she might like to have it. Nonetheless, it means that Esther has not fallen out of favor. Some unspoken circumstance has caused the king to not call for her for 30 days. Okay, she's made it to first base. And next week, we'll watch her clever plan unfold and then watch Haman entrap himself. There you go. Please rise.